I guess we'll go ahead and get going here. Today we are going to be discussing how to file the W-2 for your church pastor or other clergy you have at your church. Um, this webinar came about as I was talking with our conference office about resourcing our church treasurers. As I have done taxes, I have found that the number one problem is we don't give a lot of direction in how to fill out the W-2. And so today we are hoping to walk you through block by block so that you feel comfortable and that it's accurately reported for your pastor. We're going to be doing a couple of things, but let me introduce myself first. As I said, my name is Nancy Bunicor. I am a senior tax analyst with H&R Block. I work out of the East Berlin office with H&R Block and I specialize in clergy taxes. I have a good reason for that. My husband is a United Methodist pastor and I've been his uh, tax person for over 35 years. So this is kind of my life dealing with clergy taxes. I do need to say up front that this webinar contains general information and you should not rely upon it as your only source of authority on the topic and also that this is not a presentation of H&R Block. I will post my contact information again at the very end for you because you're more than welcome to contact me if you have questions. So what do we want to accomplish today? First, we need to look at some terminology. How we use terms in our denomination is different from how the IRS talks about these terms. So I wanna make sure that we're talking the same language. Then we're gonna work through the W-2 box by box. Then there are just some other things that your pastor will need to know and then just address a few other issues at the very end. So let's get started. Who are the clergy? For IRS purposes, ministers are people who are duly ordained, commissioned, or licensed by the church. So if you have a worship pastor or a children's minister or someone else who has the title pastor or minister, that does not necessarily qualify them for all the benefits of clergy. We're talking about people in the United Methodist Church that are elders, deacons, or licensed local pastors. Uh, we are not talking about just because we tag the word pastor or minister onto the name. Secondly, why are clergy taxes so difficult? Uh, that's because for the IRS, clergy have dual status. They are considered employees when it comes to their federal tax, but when it comes to their social security and Medicare taxes, which are called self-employment taxes, they are considered self-employed. Also, there's other um, types of their compensation that can be considered excludable for tax at different levels. And so there's many different shadings when we fill out the W-2 for our clergy. Another place I have found confusion as I've worked with my clergy clients is just simply what we call things on our pastoral compensation form. On the screen here, I am showing you block C from the charge conference form where pastoral compensation is figured out. And we have what we call the negotiated base salary and what we call the social security tax offset. That is our denominational conference formula for figuring out the total salary of a pastor. Those terms, social security tax offset, do not line up with terms on the W-2 form or other IRS terms. This just gives us our starting point for numbers. I've seen church treasurers take what's listed as social security tax offset and put it in um, the boxes on the W-2 for social security tax. And that leads to a lot of problems in filling out someone's 1040 form. So don't confuse United Methodist terminology with IRS terminology. This is a W-2 form. I'm showing it here with my example for Pastor Madison Smith. Um, filled in already is the pastor's social security number, name and address, and also the church's EIN and name and address. Hopefully that's self-explanatory. I did have a client last year who works for a charge and served three churches. Each church in that charge issued her a W-2 and they each applied different things differently. 
if your church is a charge situation, it would really be best for your pastor if the W-2 could be centralized and issuing and not something from each church. Um, and if you're in that situation, it might be worth a phone call and us talking about it because that led to so much confusion with each church writing out the W-2 in a different way. So looking at the shaded area of the W-2, the very first box is box one, where we list the federal wages, tips, and other compensation. How do we find that number? Well, it starts with first the base salary and social security offset numbers that we lift from the charge conference pastoral compensation form. This is just our starting point. When we add those two numbers together, we're gonna work from there to come up what we need to do. The second thing we need to consider is health insurance premium salary reduction. Each year as pastors choose their health insurance, the premium part that they are having to pay that's withheld from their salary, plus if they have any type of HSA or um, HFA type of things, that can be a reduction for their federal income and also state and local that is all pre-taxed if they have the agreement written out ahead of time. Where can you find this agreement if you don't already have it? Well, the easiest thing to do this is first, as I'm showing you here on the screen, a copy of what that agreement looks like. This is taken from our conference website. If you go to the conference website, you will wanna go under um, the finance and administration area for health pension and benefits. And under health insurance, you'll find forms and the health insurance premium salary reduction agreement is one of the choices. At the bottom of the screen here, I also show um, the actual page for where you would go directly to it if you don't want to walk through the screening but this is available on our conference website going back to what we were looking at before on this agreement it is to be completed before the new year begins you are not to back date these things um, and i recommend that you complete a new one each year because how they're written now they give the actual numbers for each tax year the amount that's on this the salary is actually reduced and we don't see it again. So if we're looking at the blue box at the bottom of the screen, we have the starting point and we subtract the amount that's listed on this health insurance salary reduction agreement. Next for box one, we look at the pastor's portion of their pension. We offer pastors three choices, a pre-tax, a Roth 403B or an after-tax. If the pension is pre-tax dollars, that amount is also subtracted from our starting point. And I would suggest at this point, compare the number you have with what you actually paid your pastor. Um, I have seen where when churches started to reconcile numbers, they realized they didn't pay the pastor the right amount or they maybe paid too much or too little. So it's a good time to go back and actually then compare this to the real numbers of what was paid to your pastor. Next, if you look at the charge conference pastoral comp compensation form in section G, line two gives a place where a parsonage exclusion for furnishings can be selected and an amount declared. If this was um, agreed upon for your pastor, that can also be subtracted from wages reported in box one of the W-2. If your church gives your pastor a cash allowance for parsonage instead of providing a parsonage and utilities, um, we will show you where that gets reported later, but that amount is not included in box one. So if you pay just a straight cash allowance for parsonage, that is not included in box one. So here we are at a summary of what goes into box one. We have our starting point, which is the total of the base salary plus the social security offset. We subtract out the health insurance salary reduction agreement amount. We subtract out any pre-tax portion that's withheld from the pastor's salary for his pension. And we subtract out the parsonage exclusion. And that's the amount that goes into box one. Here's my example for Pastor Madison. 
for Pastor Madison, the base salary was 45,000. The social security offset was $3,442.50. So that gives us a starting point of $48,442.50. From this amount, we subtract out what the salary reduction agreement for health insurance and an HSA, which listed here on the example is 6,768. Next, we would subtract out the pre-tax pension contribution, which on our example is 3,245. And we would also subtract out the parsonage exclusion that was approved at the charge conference of 1,500. So the amount in box one on the W-2 would be $36,929.50. And here is a sample of Form W-2 and where that amount gets posted. Now, box two, you have the option of withholding taxes if your clergy requests it. This is personally the clergy's choice. They can do estimated taxes, and if they do do estimated taxes on their own and you've not withheld any tax, box two should be empty. But if your clergy has asked that you withhold and pay on their behalf whatever amount was withheld, and they would need to work with you on whatever that figure is, should be posted there. So. Box two would be empty if nothing was withheld. If you did withheld and pay, withhold and pay in on behalf of your clergy federal taxes, this is where you would declare that amount. Next is boxes three through 10. These boxes are left completely empty. Please do not carry down the amount in box one to either box three or five. As I told you earlier, clergy are considered self-employed for Social Security and Medicare tax purposes. They, as they do their taxes, they'll have to declare amounts to figure out what their self-employment tax is. Um, so these boxes should be left completely empty. Next, we would look at box 12. And there's two possibilities of what might get put into box 12. This is where we would show pensions. First, if the pastor's portion of their pension is the pre-tax 403B, it would go here as code E, and then you would put the amount of that um, part that's been paid for their pension. If their pension is a 403B Roth, then the code is BB, and you would put it in box 12 with the amount that was taken out of the salary. It would be one or the other, not both. It depends on what type of pension plan that your pastor is in. So when we go back to Pastor Madison's example, box one would have what we have determined is the salary, and then there's nothing there again till we get to box 12, which would be Cody e because Pastor Madison has pre-tax pension contributions. And this is what the W-2 would look like at this point. One other thing that should be marked is in box 13. It's not marked on my example here, but retirement plan could be marked here as well. Next is box 14, and box 14 is titled Other. What do you put in here? I have seen all sorts of things put into this box for pastors. One, you don't have to put anything in this box. There are some options you could do. If you have to withhold a local services tax for your pastor, you could denote that here. Another option, as I'm showing in this first example, could be that you list what the fair rental value of the parsonage is and also the utilities that were paid. I really don't recommend this simply because one, it's not required, and it also could be confusing when state or local tries to understand their numbers compared to the federal numbers. These numbers don't get reflected. Um, one thing to say about parsonage fair rental value, a lot of churches think they're helping their pastor if they keep this amount low when they're doing their charge conference. You're really not helping your clergy if you keep this not a true fair rental value. If they would ever get audited, they could end up owing back penalties and back interest and taxes because that amount was not a true fair rental value for where they live. So if you've been keeping that unreasonably low, do your pastor a favor and get that more to a reasonable fair rental value.
Okay. Another option for box 14, which is in this example, if you pay a cash allowance to your pastor for in place of providing a parsonage, putting that here is a highly recommended practice. Again, it's not required, but it will help explain the state and federal, or excuse me, the state and local numbers to those taxing authorities and the differences between box one and boxes 16 and 18. If you don't give your pastor a cash allowance, but they do have a parsonage exclusion, to put that amount here in box 14, again, is highly recommended because once again, it helps state and local authorities help understand the difference between box one and box 16 and 18. Okay, we've now finished with the federal portion of the W-2 form, and we're looking at the Pennsylvania information now. And what I'm sharing is Pennsylvania information, not for other states. Box 15 of the W-2, and if I go back just for a second, you can see box 15 is where you list the state as PA, and you can repeat the employer ID number again. If it's exactly the same as what's up here in box B, above the name and address of the church, you don't have to repeat it again, but you can. It, it's just whatever your preference is there. How do we figure out, though, in box 16 what the state wages are? On this screen, you can see I have it in light gray how we got to box one's numbers. But what's taxable to federal and what's taxable to Pennsylvania are different. And so we wanna first look at that number in box one. And we need to add back in the pastor's portion of pension. We need to add back in the parsonage exclusion. And here is also where we would add in any amount of cash that was paid in a parsonage allowance in place of providing a parsonage or utilities. These items are not taxable to federal, but they are each taxable to the state of Pennsylvania. And so that's why they are added to the amount from box one to give us what would go into box 16. For PA state income tax, our state tax rate currently is 3.07%. So hopefully you have held out 3.07% of the amount in box 16. Often if um, treasurers didn't realize the differences, they've not held out the correct amount. If you only kept out 3.07% of the amount in box one, you will have not withheld enough for your pastor and they will owe taxes this year. But in the future, you're going to want to make sure you figure out these numbers ahead of time so that you're withholding the 3.07% on the correct amount. So our example again of Pastor Madison. We have the total from box one on the W-2. We're adding back in the pre-tax pension, the parsonage exclusion. Our example of Pastor Madison, um, Pastor Madison does not have a parsonage allowance, so that amounts zero but it shows you $41,674.50 would be the amount that goes in box 16. 3.07% of that would be $1,279.41. Hopefully that's what you've withheld. If it's not, you need to report what was actually withheld in this box for state. And here is a copy of the form showing box 16 and box 17 filled out. Next is local information. Most of our pastors live in localities that have local taxes that have to be formed, filed on a third form. Um, local taxes, again, are different from federal and state and what's taxable and what's not. So when we look at box 18, again, we start back at box one and we only add in the pastor's portion of pension. Pennsylvania state and Pennsylvania local taxes tax pension as it's earned, not when it's received. So that's why that's added back in. But parsonage allowance and parsonage exclusion are not taxable income for local tax purposes. So box 18 is gonna be different from Pennsylvania and from federal. Now, as I talk to our local tax authority office, this is where they really suggest having the parsonage exclusion or the parsonage allowance listed in the other because it will show them where the numbers differ and how. 
and they will understand that it's being accurately reported. Um, if those numbers are not given to them on the W-2, the clergy may be questioned about this number, but this is the pr proper reporting. You need to know the locality information and assuming you're withholding the taxes, you would have this already. But if you're not sure what locality your pastor lives in, you can always go into the municipal statistics section of the PA Department of Revenue website. It would get you the codes and also the rate for where your pastor lives. So if we look at our example again of Pastor Madison, um, we take box one and we add back the pre add back in the pre-tax pension. So for box 18 local income tax, the um, income is $40,174.50. My example put this person in Reading Township of Adams County, which is a 1.70% rate. So hopefully what was withheld for Pastor Madison was the $682.97. Again, what's actually been withheld is what should be reported here. Box 20 is where you would put the code for the place where your clergy lives. The code for Reading Township is 010105. So when we look at the W-2, this would be the completed W-2 for Pastor Smith, showing their federal, showing her pension, showing on box 14 other, the parsonage exclusion, and then the correct amounts for state and local. There is some other information your pastor needs from you to do taxes. Um, the fair rental value, which they should be able to get off the charge conference form, is one thing. But they also need to know the utilities that have been paid for the parsonage. This isn't limited to, but includes things like phone, electricity, gas, internet, trash, water, any type of utility amount. Your pastor has to pay self-employment tax on the fair rental value and the utilities that have been paid. Um, you can report these numbers again in box 14, or you can just provide them for your pastor. Um, pastors who receive a cash allowance, again, it's really good to put them into other, that amount in box 14, others, so that state and local will see the differences in the numbers and see that's been reported. Other clergy issues. If your pastor receives an honorarium for doing something like a wedding or a funeral, and they immediately sign the check over or give the cash to the church, for them, this is still self-employment income that they are responsible to report on their Schedule C in their 1040. The church would just treat this amount as a charitable contribution, just like any other charitable contribution from the pastor. If the amount is 250 or more, a receipt needs to be issued just like any other person giving a gift to the church. A clergy cannot disregard this as being paid to the church. If it was made out to them or given to them, they have to declare it. Some other clergy related issues that sometimes get confusing. Can your pastor do a salary reduction to give their tithes and offerings and not have it in their check and so they can reduce their taxable income? Nice idea, but it doesn't work. IRS says no. Um, the clergy may ask you to withhold the amount just so they don't have to write you a check back, but that's all still considered income. It cannot reduce their salary. So the church may choose if the clergy requests to do that, but again, it does not reduce the salary. Whoops. Also, how about if your church collects a love offering and gives it to your pastor at Christmas or when they graduate from seminary or some other special event? Does that affect taxes? Actually, yes. If at any time the church gives a pastor a gift, that amount is considered compensation. So let's say your church collected a $300 gift that they gave the pastor at Christmas. That $300 needs to be added into the amounts that you declare on box 1, 16, and 18. The reason why you've given your clergy member the gift is because they're your pastor. And the taxing authorities consider this income that's received and needs to be declared. Even if it's paid in cash, you need to properly declare it. Do you have to note reimbursements on the W-2? If the pastor has submitted the mileage log or receipts for reimbursement, this is not reportable income. 
The key is that they have, they have submitted the receipts or mileage logs for any payment that's been made to them beyond their salary. Just a side note, whatever was purchased is the property of the church, not the pastor. And if the church says, Pastor Smith, you can take that and have that, it's considered a gift to the pastor. So you filled out the W-2. Now, how do you file it? Well, it's highly recommended that you e-file these forms. And here I've given you the web address at the social security administrations.gov employer. Everything with the IRS nowadays is best e-filed. They really don't like it paper. They really, really don't like handwritten forms. And though some people still do it, that it really can add a lot of questions and can actually set your pastor up for being audited because it's a handwritten form. So if at all possible, please e-file. If you really can't and, and you're really not computer savvy and you can't find a computer savvy friend to help you, um, you will need to get the forms to fill out the W-2, the transmittal W-3, and the instructions of where this gets mailed to. But the most important thing is this has to be filed with the Social Security Administration by January 31st. Don't run late. Get it done now and save yourself a lot of grief. I hope I've answered some questions and helped you get this done. I know many of you don't work with taxes or are not CPAs and you're just volunteers and you're trying to do what's best for your church. Please feel free to call me. This is my office number. Email me. I've given you both my business and my personal email here. I also list here at the bottom three websites, irs.gov, um, PA Department of Revenue, and also our own conference. There's many resources on our own conference website that can help you as you're doing your work as a church treasurer. I especially wanna highlight under the finance and administration um, section, under local church resources, there is a resource entitled Financial Information for Churches and Pastors. It is dated 2018, but most of the information in it is still accurate and it's a very well-written document to give you a lot of resources that will help you please feel free to reach out. My goal is to help support you and what you do so that you feel more comfortable and know you're doing it correctly. I appreciate your time. Looks like there's some Q&A here. Okay, let's um, take some questions. So if, uh, whoops, here we go. It looks like we've got two questions that popped up. Uh, can we get a copy of these slides? Um, are we going to make a link? Yes. We are going to make a link where you can get a copy of the slides um, on the conference website. So that is going to be made available. And also this is being recorded so that if you need or if you know somebody else who'd like to look at it again, we are going to do that. And it looks like Lori just simply had question marks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Lori, if, uh, if you had other questions you wanted to throw in there. Please feel free if you wanted to use the Q&A buttons at the top of the screen or bottom of the screen. Uh, is there documentation for the deductions in box one? Um, it's just part of our records as the church. Um, it's, it's been documented in the charge conference report in the sense that um, the parsonage exclusions there, if the, the, the health insurance agreement, that is one document you need to have like from the IRS. I'm not quite sure what you mean, Lori, from like the IRS. I, I think what she might be talking about is, is there something else that the church needs to file with no. the IRS no. talking about the deductions? No, you can just the W-2 gives the numbers that's needed. Okay. I am not a quick, quick books expert, but if you email me a question, I can refer to a friend who should be able to possibly answer a question on QuickBooks. QuickBooks is uh, QuickBooks Online D is a wonderful program that does have many features, um, and if you wanted to call with some questions, uh, we can see what we can do uh, to help you through that. Lori again, stating it's out. We talked about that, Helen. If your pastor contributes to an external financial institute, um, I didn't know our pastors could and it would fall under that. If it's not being done through the church, I would have to investigate that and get back with you, Helen, on the fact. The question is, if your pastor contributes to an external financial institute, what code would go in block 12, meaning for pension? Um, 
some of our pastors do have it set up have, as it's that announced. they have a, a separate retirement contribution sent somewhere else. Okay. Yes. Um, Helen, I'd like to get your information to get back with you on that, to make sure that I'm telling you correctly, because that was not a situation I was aware of. So Helen, be sure to shoot Nancy a, a direct email. send me a direct email. No, it is not. Okay. What about bivocational licensed pastors? Um, you need to write them a W-2, no matter what amount they've earned. Um, if they are a licensed local pastor, even though they're bivocational, for the amount that they've earned from the church, it must be submitted as a W-2, even if it's just a small amount. Please make that as a W-2. I've seen W-2s for just a few dollars. You need to fill it out for them. Do you like TurboTax Deluxe? Oh, I can't answer that question. I work for H&R <laughs> Block. Um, I will say this. TurboTax has a good product. H&R Block also has a good product and the benefit of the H&R Block online, and I don't make a dollar from it, so I'm not making a sale saying this, is if the person ever has to go get help, we can see their records. There might be a year they need assisted help, um, but yeah, I got to confess before I did taxes, I used TurboTax, um, but I am an H&R Block person. <laughs> and Jen's asking um, about the parsonage. Do we subtract the parsonage exclusion from the local taxable income? It, it would already be subtracted. If you start with box one at that point, it's already subtracted out. But yes, parsonage exclusion is not taxable locally. Okay. And looks like we got one more from Linda. Ah, if the fair rental value has not been completed by the church, that's a real issue that that was not completed back during charge conference, because that is part of what should have been done. Uh, actually, you'll have to do some investigation. Um, really, to come up with that number, one of the best things to do is to contact somebody who's a real estate person in the area and ask them, what is the fair rental value of this parsonage, and give them a description. Um, that really should have been established, and that's kind of a deeper problem that it was not established then, but that's how you find that number. And frankly, that will be the, responsible of your, the responsibility of your staff parish relations team uh, to care for that if that needs done. Um, can you address how to report medical insurance deductions on the W-2 box 14? It, you don't have to. If it has been done as a reduction, a salary reduction agreement, then it's just excluded from the numbers in box one. Um, you don't have to list that anywhere else on the W-2. If the salary reduction agreement was not completed, then it's taxable income. I really hate to say that, but it is. That's why that re reduction agreement being done before the year starts is so important. And then uh, Amy's asking, please explain the parsonage exclusion. Where can I find the parsonage exclusion? It's on page two. Parsonage exclusion is on page two of your charge conference um, form. That six. shows Form six. Form six of the charge conference forms that showed the pastoral compensation. That amount has to be approved at charge conference before it can go into force. What the co charge conference is doing is letting the pastor set aside part of their cash salary to go toward parsonage furnishings, which by IRS standards and local tax standards is excludable income. So that should hopefully answer that. Uh, the next question, are you saying that no PA state tax should be taken out of pastor salary? No, I'm not saying that at all. If that's what you heard, you misunderstood me. You need to take PA state tax out of the proper amount that's taxable to PA. Um, technically, for state, a uh, pastor can do estimated payments to state as well as to federal. You don't have to withhold, um, but it puts the response back, back onto the pastor. But if you are withholding, you just wanna make sure you're doing it on the correct amount. But yes, they, if they're, you're not withholding, they have to do estimated. Looks like we had a few more pop in here. Uh, we answered that one. Jennifer, I was 
a paid staff at church at a church and then transition to a licensed pastor July 1. Uh, will this be a separate W-2? Um, if you're at the same church, they would just need to treat the second half of the year income like I've described. The first half of the year income would be treated um, just like if you were an employee somewhere. You would not have the, the detailings of a uh, pastor compensation. So if it's the same church, it can be one W-2. They just need to handle how it's done for each six months. And if um, you want some more detailed work, contact me personally and I can help you with the numbers if that might be of help. And, oh, Beverly's got one here. Uh, what if a pastor moved this year? Do we report all the annual amounts? What about health insurance premium salary reduction agreement? If your pastor moves mid-year, Everything is just the six months that they are there, including the utility amounts. The utility would be the utility amounts that were paid from January through June. And then your new pastor would have the other six months. Um, when your new pastor comes in July, you wanna get that premium, that health insurance premium reduction agreement filled out before you write the first paycheck. It needs to be done again before the salary is received. So yes, you would need to fill out a new one of the agreements with the pastor when they first come. I think, oh, we got another note here. Uh, if a two-point charge decides to have one of the churches handle the pastor's compensation, and then does the other church uh, forward them a check for the full amount that is owed for form, it says form C, I think you mean form six. Um, yes, that's my understanding. If you have a multi-point charge and one church is paying the pastor's compensation, then the percentage that is being paid by the other church is just paid as a check to the one church who then would, would report the W-2 and the pastoral compensation is received. So Nancy, you're saying that if there were two churches and only one is actually paying, then only one W-2 needs to be created? Correct. Who's ever the actual paying body is who issues the W-2. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I think that may be where we're at. Okay. Again, I, I consider this part of my ministry, helping to support other churches with the resources I have. And I'd love to hear from you if I can be a further help. Thank you so much for checking in today. Uh, we hope to see, from, see you again soon. And take care.